Okay, I'm ready to laugh. <laughs> Great. Ah, I will ring the bell you laugh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the... <laughs> You're supposed to laugh. Oh. <laughs> I think I'll let you do your own introduction. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm so honored to be able to introduce my friend, longtime comrade Elliot. <coughs> I really cannot recommend him too highly. Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry to steal a little of humor. Uh, so as you know, Elliot Sullivan, he is a professional comedian. And he has actually written, published books, believe it or not. You have a license. And he's a professional comedy writer. And he studied Eastern and Western philosophy, psychology, and cutting-edge transformational technologies. <laughs> I have no idea what those are. But they, make money. they really are great. And, <laughs> and so it's Italy, And for a long time, he's done that. And uh, he studied with some great beings not only just the philosophies such as Tuli Baba and Gene Houston. And Gene Houston, I'll end with an endorsement from Gene Houston, who says, quote, Elliot Sullivan's work is terrific. And that I think we can all vouch for, that that is really the case. And so I can say for sure, Elliot is really one. And you're one too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Avery. Uh, you are too kind. Uh, <clears throat> Avery, by the way, has really been helpful in developing, helping me with this talk. So I really have to give him a shout out. Uh, I've got to thank Mark for uh, for filming this the event tonight. Uh, Mark's filming it because it's going to be a training film, and this could go two ways. If this is if this concept, radical ridiculousness, is big, this could be as big as Tony Robbins. If it isn't, I have a job as a waiter in Moosewood Restaurant, so I've got my bases covered either way. Also, by the way, I have to just give a give also a thanks to Kurt Lickman. He's not here. But he helped, he often designed that poster, and he's been just tremendous. So Kurt, Kurt, wherever you are, how are you all? So um, also, big, big shout out to Harriet. My God, she was so responsive to my request to do this tonight. Uh, and because she rallied the board, uh, 24 hours there was a decision. It was great. So thank you so much. And the board, thank you. Uh, they may be regretting this uh, later, but, uh, you know, what can we say? So, uh, first thing I have to say is this is, um, let's see. So, you've got to bear with me tonight because this is uh, something I've been thinking on and working on around the clock, and there are still so many new rough edges. So if you guys, so I appreciate your being here, but, uh, and I appreciate Michael Eisman being here, because if anyone in the audience slips into coma, <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> Michael will be, be, be here to take care of it. Keep them out of their pain. Yes. So uh, before we start, we need to warm up a little bit. So everybody put a very demure, formal face and de demeanor on. And then we're going to make a face, a, 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 a funny face to the person next to you, left or right, that's beyond any funny face you've ever made. Okay, so start out being very cool. Bye. Bye. Yeah! I did it! And you're going to like it! And then be cool again. Bye. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so let me count. Everyone's, re everyone's regretting doing this. I can see that. Are you ready? We haven't got anything. One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay, Jimmy, you are cool. Hi. 
I'm going to see her. Always play her. Always play her. Then I want you to do baby talk or baby actions. But really, like, all out. And then be demurred. Good to see you. Okay? One, two, three. That's fine. That was great. That was very nice. Okay. Very good. Uh, I'm impressed. <laughs> and the last exercise, you're going to go to someone, if you only have, if, you know, if you, someone to, to your side, and you're going to shake pinkies. The ladies be gen gentle with the men. They're, they have very soft pinkies, so don't squeeze too hard. So just shake pinkies, look, look the person in the eye, and just say hi. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that pretty much wraps up the evening. <laughs> so, so I'm the good job, by the way. Give yourselves a applause. So I'm the perfect person to give this talk uh, because. I have been a chronic serious aholic all my life. Uh, even though I was the class clown in high school and all that stuff, I still secretly spent years in seriously serious anonymous. Now, I was so serious and I was so sober that serious anonymous sent me to rehab to do drugs. <laughs> I actually had my midlife crisis when I was 16, which which saved, which was a big help. Uh, saved me a lot of worry. Uh, but I had I had good parents. Um, my parents were very different. My father was very uh, well. He he spent about. He actually volunteered for World War II, and then after the war was over, he stayed in the military reserves. He wasn't. Uh, yeah, so he was very military. My mother was just the opposite. She was a smother mother. <clears throat> so my father would tell me, Elliot, you've got to be more decisive. I see you procrastinating. Do it immediately. And the other hand, my mother was just the opposite. I think I should ring a bell. <laughs> So I, I bought a, a toy gun uh, from the local store. It looked like a real gun, cheap, but it looked like a real gun. And when there was, we had a big dinner one time, and uh, there was tons of food. My mother was about to give me my fourth helping of lasagna, and that's when I pulled out the gun. I said, "All right, Ma, back away from the table, put down the spatula, Ma, nice and slow." Drop the spatula. I'd laugh. Okay. So that trip didn't work too well. <laughs> we won't do that one for the library. <laughs> but my parents, my parents were good people. They, they, they did a lot of yelling, but they made a pact with each other that they would never go to bed angry. So as a result, they never slept for 35 years. <laughs> I was, I was. I was a seeker from an early age. You know, Avery's going to tell me I was a sucker at an early age. But I read a lot of self-help books. I read books like The Six Critical Steps You Need to Take to Find the Three Vital Keys That Will Unlock the Seven Ancient Secrets <laughs> of the Eight Magical Principles of Success. And I actually did a seminar with the author. And I went up to him at the break. I said, you know, I lost one of the three vital keys. He said, no problem. For $75, we can make you another key. I tried Tony Robbins' work. And uh, the reason why is he promised me unlimited power, except it was for a limited time only. And I missed the deadline. I tried atheism for a while. Uh, I couldn't really prove that God didn't exist. 
I had to accept it on faith. <laughs> People would come up to me and say, what religion are you? I go, I'm an atheist. They go, yeah, but what religion are you? I go, I'm an atheist. They go, yeah, but are you a Jewish atheist, a Buddhist atheist, a Catholic? What religion are you? But even though I was an atheist, I still went to church. It was the church of ontology. Now, not Scientology. This was ontology. It was the philosophy of being. And in order to be a member of the church, you had to exist. <laughs> Although there were a lot of members who were there illegally. <laughs> You'd walk into the church, there'd be a huge picture of Charles Darwin. And when you go to the seat, go back to your seat, instead of crossing yourself, you'd question mark yourself. You'd go like this. <laughs> then you'd slap your navel to dot the question mark. Well, you have no idea what a rift is caused with the agnostics <coughs> who claim that the question mark was their symbol. <laughs> so it's still, it's still uh, probably you're going to end up in the Supreme Court because no, no way is it going to be figured out. But I got tired of atheism after a while. No holidays. <laughs> no holidays. So uh, that's when I decided to get more spiritual. I got into the work of Eckhart Tolle. Um, Eckhart Tolle was great because he, he, his philosophy is that you should always be in the present moment. And I tried being always in the present moment. But you know, but frankly, I just don't have the time. <laughs> I tried, I found that when I was present, I would, my mind would wander, and I would drift, and I'd realize my mind wandered, and then I'd become present again. So I devised a meditation. I'd be present five minutes, and absent five minutes, <laughs> and present five minutes. Except when I was present, my mind would wander, I'd be absent. When I'd be absent, i go, oh, I'm absent. No, I'm present. <laughs> so I wrote a book on how to do this meditation. It's called Be Absent Now. <laughs> but eventually, uh, I just gave up on, on trying to find the secrets of life until I realized that they were all posted on WikiLeaks. <laughs> So that's a, that was a saving grace. <laughs> so the big question is, what is the, your biggest obstacle in life? That's the question. Say the secret word, win $100. What's your biggest, what is the biggest obstacle in life? <laughs> Anybody? What is your biggest obstacle in life? Gosh, you think from this group? I would say fear. But fear? That's a good start. Good start, Harriet. Brave woman. <laughs> Anybody? What's your biggest obstacle? Sleeping. What? Sleeping. Sleeping. Okay. Not as good a start as Harry's, but not bad. <laughs> it's a start, nevertheless. Somebody. This is Doubt. What? Doubting. Doubt. Doubt. Doubting. Very good. What's before doubting? What's before sleeping? What's before fear? Being conscious. What? Being conscious. All right. What's before being conscious? Waking up. <laughs> All right. Boy, I never expected this response. Did I? Yeah. <laughs> Aren't you the biggest obstacle in your life? No? no? I'm not kidding. Okay. <laughs> I may have to, this coma may have started way, way early by the way. So, you don't have a book standing in your own way? Is that what you mean? All right. So, aren't we the biggest obstacle in our lives? But is, is I'll, I'll, I'll pretend you're answering me, so we will get it. But is it really us who is the obstacle? What is it about us that's the obstacle? Is it our minds? <laughs> it's our minds. What? Oh, our minds. Our minds. Our minds. But what is it about the mind that's the, that's the problem? Uncontrollable. Uh, okay. 
<laughs> interesting, interesting. What else? Isn't it taking things seriously? It's taking things seriously. <laughs> Linda's got it. Linda's got it. <laughs> so, you guys are sharp today. <laughs> so, isn't, isn't serious seriousness the biggest obstacle that problem that the world has? I mean, can you think of anything bigger than that? Except maybe global warming or something? <laughs> All right. Well, nothing can happen until a thought ha a thought occurs, and no action will take place on the thought until the thought's taken seriously, right? So, and, and people's psyches are uh, okay. So, you guys did really good in that. Have <laughs> 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 to take that test again. <laughs> so, radical ridiculousness is about the uh, is about serious management and uh, using humor to decouple seriousness from the thoughts. Because if you're if people have limiting beliefs, if we have limiting beliefs, there that's an that's a serious attachment, and humor is the best way to decouple from the thoughts. Okay, so humor is the jaws of life that frees us from the claws of life, <laughs> to laugh at all the flaws of life, and open all the doors of life. By aligning with the laws of life, we advance the greatest cause of life. Okay, so you could maybe we'll write that down. We have no slide for that one, Ellen. What? We have no slide for that one. No, okay. So radical ridiculousness is a paradigm shift. And normally humor is thought of as comic relief, as the spoonful of sugar that makes the medicine go down. Uh, uh, it's the laughter is the best medicine. You've, you've all heard that. And I must have listened to at least 10, 10, 10 talks, or 10 TED talks, whichever, <laughs> whichever you like. And they're all talking about laughter, and they're all saying the same thing. That laughter boosts the immune system, and gets the <coughs> lungs going, and makes you feel good, and it doesn't cost anything. But is that really what Plato was talking about? Now Plato said, was asked, what, what is the best way, how should we be in life? And Plato said the way to be in life is to be in, in play, to be in a state of play. So what did Plato yeah. mean? And why did they call him Plato if he believed in Plato? <laughs> he had a rival called Workto who was busy paying the bills while Plato was goofing on. So what, what Plato had in mind is that the basic nature of the human being is in flow, is, is, is a, that's it, you got it. <clears throat> Whereas the, the paradigm that, that we hear about all these laughter clubs, and by the way, I'm a certified laughter yoga facilitator, certified by someone who is in turn certified by the founder, Madan, Madan Kataria in India. So I'm allowed to speak about, I know what, of what I speak. Serious. Hey, hey, yeah, so you know, like, like, don't, don't argue with me, okay? <laughs> so, the laughter yoga concept is that we're all stressed out and we need laughter to cheer us up. But the problem is not, nothing wrong with laughter cheering you up, the problem is why did you get stressed out? So what is your worldview such that we're all in survival? So, radical ridiculousness goes from <clears throat> the paradigm shift of using humor to help us survive to seeing that our preoccupation with surviving is souring our very nature, which is humor. Got it? Ready? Ready about taking notes? Okay, good. So Avery, I think we're ready for our that first slide. So does humor sweeten the stress and anxiety of life, or does stress and anxiety sour the humor of life? Now, <clears throat> so radical ridiculousness is, is designed to shift us from that state 
of, of survival, stress and anxiety, to a state of relaxed play, joy, or, uh, or serene joy, as Ajashanti says. So radical ridiculousness is, is a course of lessons to take us from point A to point B. And the first lesson is, next slide, your mind is a joke. So when you see that your mind is a joke, you're off to a good start. Now who can read the two triangles on the bottom? Quickly, out loud. Read it quickly. Paris loud. in the spring. What? Paris in the spring, once in a lifetime. Okay. Loud. Someone else. In a lifetime. Paris in the spring, once in a lifetime. Okay. Paris in that last spring, once in a lifetime. Who said that, Marge? Oh. Oh. Do we have a prize? From Lawrence. <laughs> so, right? Do you see that now? Paris in the the spring, right? Once in a, a lifetime, right? So that's how the mind works. It just it doesn't. It works. You got the point. <laughs> So six, we have 60 to 90,000 thoughts go through our head every day. And yet, if you're looking for food for thought, you're going to die of starvation. <laughs> so generally speaking, the mind is generally speaking. So the next step after you realize that, very good, Avery, perfect, is to realize the humor of the mind of misery. Now, Mark Twain said, I've lived through some terrible things in my life, some of which actually happened. <laughs> so you can't take the world of misery too seriously. There are lonely women who, when they see a highway sign saying, Jesus is coming, pull over and put on lipstick. Of course, men are a piece of work. They refuse to have sex in space, because afterwards they can't get up and leave. <laughs> I thought that would do better, but that's okay. <laughs> so, very often, <clears throat> there you go, perfect. So, there, there's the lament of Les Miserables is, my sorrow is a result of my low self-esteem owing to the regret and remorse I feel about the guilt I experience when my anger arises over my frustration in dealing with the shame that erupts when I feel helpless, hopeless, and inadequate at coping with my grief and despair regarding the barrage of defense mechanisms that get activated because of my inability to cope with my low self-esteem. And that pretty much summarizes the humor of the mind of misery. <clears throat> so, the key thing to keep in mind, not keep in mind, but make sure you get it, is that you are not your mind. Now, in this group, that's not really a revelation, but it is in six billion minds around the world. People take their minds seriously, and they think they are their minds. Um, so, yeah. So the problem is, is that we take our thoughts <laughs> for granted. <laughs> so I, 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 read, I write a lot of teaching poems. And I wrote, I wrote one teaching poem that's particularly appropriate, if I can find it. When thought is bought, the mind is caught. When mind is caught, it's tense and taut. It's tense and taut with doubt and fear. With doubt and fear, the mind is fraught. The doubt derails your train of thought. The fear derails the peace you sought. Well, why, oh why did you have to buy that silly thought that led to naught? Next time, let the thought fly by. Then you'll be high and not distraught. <laughs> Please, please. Don't, 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 don't force it. Don't force it. <laughs> so, I wrote it. Let's see. 
There's another. Th so one more poem. This is called Those Thoughts Are Not True, Those Thoughts Are Not You. Those thoughts are not true, those thoughts are not you. Whatever you think, those thoughts are not glue. You're not in cement, you're not tied in knots, beliefs are not real, they're just simply thoughts. They come and they go, they leave and come back, they move to and fro, they're white and they're black. They get the job done, they go up the works, they fill life with fun. They fill life with quirks. So focus instead on your truest goal. Focus instead on your being whole. You're not incomplete. You're not second class. You're neither chopped meat nor a complete ass. <laughs> you're not on a tightrope and you're not on thin ice. If that's what you think, then try thinking twice. Those thoughts are not true. Those thoughts are not you. So live life anew. That old life is through. Right, we'll take sympathy applause. We'll, we'll accept sympathy applause tonight. So I was just picturing uh, a samurai warrior. You know, they commit harikari or seppuku. I was just picturing them uh, just about to, 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 to commit harikari. Huh? Thoughts are not true? What about honor? Honor just a thought. Oh shit. Oh, what about honor family? No oh, more thought. Should have said something sooner. <laughs> Mark, you're getting all this on, on film, aren't you? <laughs> going right to YouTube. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, there we go. So, your double mind is your double bind. Now, normally people, when they read this or hear it, they think of talking about the left brain and right brain, right? Well, this has nothing to do with the left brain or the right brain. That's because the left brain is not always right. <laughs> and people who are not in their right mind are often not using their left brain. <laughs> so this is more like, uh, you know, the teachings of Ramesh Balsakar. He had concepts called the thinking mind and the working mind. Mm -hmm. So funky mind is the thinking mind, it's the egoic mind. And functional mind is like working mind. So I can give you a good example of both of them. Uh, I was in India. Uh, and I had, I, I was looking for a, my sandal. I had one sandal and I couldn't find the other. And I, I think people are ahead of me already, it's all right. <laughs> and uh, I looked all over, and there are only a few places it could have been. The closet, you know, this area, this area. And I, I was just going absolutely nuts. Where was the other sandal? On your foot. On your foot. On my foot. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, so that's funky mind. Uh, and then I was doing, um, I, I did, often did seminars when I lived in New York City. Uh, I did seminars at the Marriott Marquis Hotel. Are anybody familiar with that? That's uh, <clears throat> located around Times Square, 46th, 47th and Broadway. And the Marriott Marquis converts their fifth floor ballroom uh, into a, a, a lecture room, a, an auditorium. So when there's a break for lunch, <clears throat> everybody, 2,500 people, leave the room, the ballroom, to go to lunch. Now there's only one problem. There's a bank of elevators taking people down, and then there's an escalator. So is the bottleneck is horrendous. So it takes forever. You're reaching your way as if you're in gridlock traffic, bumper to, you know, chest to rear end traffic. So I say to myself, you know, there must be a better way to do this. So 
So I said, what if I go up to the seventh floor? That was the next step. There was an escalator that went to the seventh floor. So I take the escalator to the seventh floor, and the, there's nobody at the bank of the uh, bank of elevators. So this is a 48-story building. So I was immediately able to catch an elevator coming down at the seventh floor, from the seventh floor. It stops, of course, at the fifth floor, right? And immediately gets flooded with all the people. But I'm already in the elevator. So it then quickly goes down to the ground level, and I'm out. Now, I'm saying to myself, this is not higher mathematics. But how many people, this, these, these people are very capable, very smart, and I'm not patting, you know, you know, I'm not patting, you know, okay, why not? <laughs> but the question is, how come, there, there weren't like a stream of people coming up with the same idea as I had. So that's functional mind, where you stop and think, think and utilize your capability. Okay. You got the idea. So if you're at the Marriott Key, bring your lunch. <laughs> so, good. So funky mind is a conditional mind, a fictional mind, a frictional mind, and an addictional mind. Uh, it includes all your assumptions, your beliefs, your expectations, entitlements, projection, denial, resistance, etc. So, and frictional mind, the mind <coughs> has 50 shades of nay and is built on saying no. Go to the next one. So imagine if MLK had the title as this title as a speech instead of this instead of the title that he had. <clears throat> so let's go to the next one. So I wrote a teaching poem about the addictive mind. It's okay, this is the last poem, so you, you don't have to you can keep your applause to a minimum. So the addictive mind has <clears throat> The, 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 the last thing that it's addicted to is substances. It's, much more, it's more addicted to its own thought patterns and habits and routines. Uh, and people think more about their substance than actually doing the substance or the behavior. So thought addiction is our main affliction, though all these thoughts are purely fiction. It's not much fun when thoughts were undone. These thoughts are like a crucifixion. The thoughts are closer than our very own clothes. The thoughts are closer than our very own nose. As if they're in stone with a life of their own, those thoughts that arose are so hard to oppose. The thoughts are filled with pain and sorrow, and so we wallow in thoughts so hollow. Are they here to stay? Will they ever go away? We got through today. Will we get through tomorrow? Should we call a mortician? or perhaps a magician. What's the condition? And who's the physician? We know how we feel, but are these thoughts real? Isn't humor, in fact, the perfect prescription? Yes, thought addiction is our main affliction, but understand with real conviction. The mind's a show, so let it go. Now give your thoughts a swift eviction. I'm just going to stick with the bombs, uh, Mark. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, let's see. So, instead of funky mind, we have functional mind. We could change that one. Yeah. Now, functional mind, there we go, <clears throat> explores the four portals. The four portals of power are the functions of ah, feeling, aha, knowledge, hya, willing, and haha, humor. <laughs> now these are very extensive. The, the world of feeling, for instance, uh, by the way, this is, we, we spent a whole session just on uh, this concept alone because these are your tools 
these are you, this, these are your functional. This is functional mind at its best. So ah includes deep emotional availability, feeling your feelings without feeding your feelings. Um, I think James Hillman said a soul not seen develops symptoms. So the feeling function is uh, unbelievably important. Sometimes I think it's the most important, even though we're all think you know we think we think that we're all thinking people. The, the aha function is working with your full intelligence and, of course, your intuition. Kya is taking action. The ha, -ha function is, is the largest function we use in radical ridiculousness because it includes the function of creativity and the imagination. So we're going to do an exercise. And the exercise is called Humorize and Humanize. So uh, we can put the lights up. And put them all away. Great. Okay. Are you in, slipping into coma? Or anything? <laughs> it's okay. Um, do you want you guys want to stretch for a second? Yes. Mm -hmm. No, you're okay. What? It's already a stretch. <laughs> it's what? It's already a stretch. <laughs> yeah, I know. Okay. All right. Does everybody have a card, uh, an index card, and a pen? No. Okay. They will. They will soon. We have a method. You pick a card, any card. They're all the same. Now we have lots of pens. It's a party favor. Okay, everybody, everybody have a card, everybody have a pen. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> there were two couples that were walking late at night. This is uh, in Florida. Uh, and the men, the men were walking with each other, and the women were a little bit ahead, walking with each other and talking. And the men are talking, and one says to the other, oh my god, we ate at such a fantastic restaurant last night. It was unbelievable. I mean, the food was fantastic. Not huge portions, but big enough. You couldn't even eat what they had. And such a nice variety. And the waitress, oh, so pleasant, so nice. Could, could have been nicer. And I was waiting for a big price, and I look at the bill, it was not bad. The price was extremely reasonable. So the other man says, well, what was the name of the restaurant? He goes, wait, it's a flower. It, it's a flower, it's like, it has petals like this. The, the petals are usually red, they're very velvety, and there's usually a long stem with thorns. A rose. That's it. Rose, what was the name of that restaurant that we put our night last night? <laughs> All right. So this is the exercise. Uh, <clears throat> do you know how to, to humorize? Oh, so everybody pick an issue or uh, some, a concern. Something that is bothering you. Something that you'd like to not have. But on a scale of one to five, pick an issue that's no more than a four. Okay? We don't want to deal with trauma tonight or post-traumatic stress disorder. We're going to do that for another. I think people are already experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay? So pick an issue with a, with a, a, a charge of one to four. Okay? And now on the, 
on that issue, now rate that issue on a scale of 1 to 10. Okay? How, how heavy is it? <coughs> Would you rate, rate it a, okay? You got it? Get your issue, not, not traumatic, but an issue, something that's bothering you. You think about it a lot. You you know it's not resolved. Okay, everybody got one. No. Are you talking about an issue that's personal or an issue that's personal? Objective? Personal. Ah, okay. I'll make this very personal. Ah, okay. You can do it for me right now. I mean, if that's an issue. Should write our numbers. What? Write our number. Uh, just, just mentally. You could do it mentally. That's fine. Okay. Everybody have an issue. Okay. So. First, we're going to humorize the object of your concern. So we're going to humorize them. It could be a person, it could be a, a, a problem, or something that you want to overcome, something you're not getting through. So the way to humorize is to exaggerate be, way beyond belief. So if you're angry, <coughs> I want to kill. We have to get very angry. Uh, characterize caricaturize them. If you think they, they're misguided, they're complete schmuck idiots. Okay, you got it? Make them, find a cartoon character for them, exaggerate it, and humorize them or whatever the obstacle is. Got it? Okay. Now, humorize yourself. Whatever attitude or you're having, experiencing, whatever emotion it is, exaggerate that to the uh, Yeah, okay, okay. Exaggerate that way out of proportion. If you're bad, be furious. If you're uh, being the victim, be really be the victim of the situation. If you've been treated unfairly or unjust, etc., you've really been dealt a really bad deal. Okay? Now, humorize the situation. See how ridiculous the situation is. Okay? How are we doing? Okay. Yes? Okay, now we're going to humanize. Now, humanize them. Be human beings. They're doing the best they can. Or put yourself in their shoes. See it from their point of view. They're, they're, they're human beings. The situation is, from, is a human situation. Humanize yourself. Start giving yourself a little love. Give yourself a break. Give yourself some affection. Give yourself some understanding. Now, you now humanize the situation. Now, it's very easy for this to happen. It's very natural. It could be very normal, understandable. Okay. And let me know when you're done. Okay? Now, when you're finished, go back to the charge that you originally had on this issue and see if it was the same, more, or less. And, and some brave souls, let me share a little bit with me. Tell me what you experienced. Oh, by the way, this can be done, this cycle can be repeated again. You can do this again. Humorize them, humorize yourself, humorize the situation, humanize them, humanize yourself. So since the mind, since repetition got us into this, repetition can get us out of it. Okay? So who'd like to share? Or do you need more time? Do you have any phenobarbital? <laughs> Any difference? Anything?
Did this do nothing? If it did nothing, tell me it did nothing. Nothing? No, it did. It did? Any insights? Well, we're going to have to get these people enrolled in that. <laughs> Anyone, or if you found it useful, or if there was a shift, raise your hand. One, two, three. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. If there was no shift, raise your hand. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Well, what did we learn? So when I was uh, developing this talk tonight, there were times when I was uh, not quite as light and jovial as I would have liked to have been. And I tried, did this myself, and I found it very effective, extremely effective, to exaggerate and make fun of my own seriousness. Uh, and, and I just, I mean, the lightening up was, was almost instantaneous. So try this at home. If it comes up, try, you know, experiment. And see see if it if there's something that happens in the next you know 50 60 years where <laughs> this can be applicable and see if huh? okay so <clears throat> uh, I think we're ready for the next for the next next slide <clears throat> more slides. Hmm. okay so the next <clears throat> So the next concept is, the, the biggest concept in radical ridiculousness is the distinction between mental you and fundamental you. Now, we're all used to using the word ego, but uh, <clears throat> I like mental you better than ego because mental you uh, tells you a little bit more about the nexus that the ego is. I just heard a talk from Ajashanti. Uh, <clears throat> who said he likes to use the term psychological self rather than ego because it's more descriptive. And we use the phrase as well, I'm having a problem with my ego. But if you said, my psychological self is having a problem with my psychological self, the absurdity is a little, a, a little, bit, a little bit more dramatic. So, <clears throat> mental you is, is, the, is the ego, whereas fundamental you is who you really are, hence the terms. But the way I'm using fundamental you is on, a, on a, the way Hawkins uses his scale, David Hawkins, uh, it's on a gray scale rather than just the over-self or the absolute or the Brahman. Uh, <clears throat> fundamental you uh, originates from being authentic, from uh, being having integrity, from self-honesty all the way up to unconditional love. So there's a hierarchy all the way up to the over self. So that's how we're using fundamental you. So, so to give you an example of these uh, concepts, uh, I'm, I'm taking two very extreme examples. Now who knows who this person is? Okay. So <clears throat> recently, uh, now before I start, I want to explain I'm not a forensic psychologist and we're not uh, I'm not commenting as if I know who who he really was and what he really did and why. But everyone knows that Anthony Bourdain committed suicide, right? Okay. So he was a top chef. He had a, he, everything going for him. He was living in a fast lane. You know, he he met with Barack Obama. He met with great celebrities. Uh, he he went all around the world, <clears throat> and right in the middle of a shoot, he commits suicide. So. For teaching purposes, I'm going to speculate to illustrate a point. Okay, so I wrote another little poem, a little teaching, a little kind of teaching napkin poem. It goes, <clears throat> so I could be wrong, I could be right, that's, that's not the point. We're here to get, get the concept. So Anthony Bourdain traversed the fast lane, a suicide that we cannot explain. They say he was vain, doing lines of cocaine. And although he was in pain, why couldn't he refrain? It's tragic, of course, but it's also a name. Now a life full of hope could go right down the drain. It just goes to show how the mind is insane. 
When there's no higher plane, the mind has free reign. When there's no higher plane, the mind has free reign. So even though Anthony Bourdain was <clears throat> living the life that everybody dreamed of, he was secretly living a life of self-imposed exile. He was living in a maximum security prison, and the prison was called Mental U. So Mental U is a nexus of thoughts which cycle on each other, and there's just no way out. And the seriousness of that is evidenced, as I'm speculating, with Anthony Bourdain. Now let's take the complete, complete, complete opposite perspective. Now, I <coughs> attended a talk of uh, our beloved His Holiness in New York City in Manhattan at the Beacon Theater. This was many years ago. And the place was packed. It holds about 2,000 people. And uh, His Holiness is doing a, a ritual where he has to face the four directions. Only he got the, the directions mixed up. And he, he stops and he bursts out <laughs> laughing. He goes, ha, ha. Don't you have a big mistake? <laughs> now, if anybody's words, people hang on anyone's words, you've got to hang on the words of the Dalai Lama. Everyone in the world listens to him. Whatever he does, the eyes are on him 24-7. Only the Dalai Lama knows he's the eternal Buddha, the Buddha nature. He knows he's not the role of the Dalai Lama. He's not Tenzin Gyatso. Uh, so he has complete freedom to laugh his, his head off at himself making a mistake. So that's the full expression of fundamental you. And the previous example was the, was the full negative expression of mental you. <clears throat> so the takeaway, yeah. <clears throat> So fundamental you forgot that mental you is who it's not. Fundamental you is in the world, but not of the world, and it knows functional mind. Normally, funky mind is our boss, but funky mind is fired, and functional mind becomes our general manager. So through the mind of mastery, we get in gear about what we truly want in life. What you, what you can do or dream, you can begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. Who said that? Goethe. Now, you'll, this one you won't get. Begin it. Be not afraid. This very hour, begin to do the work thy spirit glories in. A thousand unseen forces wait to aid. Be not afraid. Begin. Begin. That, did you say that, Simon? No, no. Who said that? That's us. Oh, same perspective. I, I asked, that was in one of the, in the notebooks. Yeah. And I asked Randy, I said, Randy, because it was just by itself, uh, he said, did, did PB write that? He says, well, you know, I don't know. Why don't you Google it and see if you could find the author of it? Well, I Googled it and I found the author of it. It's PB. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> So the mind of mastery, uh, then <clears throat> you're, you're getting in gear. And then the last section of the course is the mind of mystery, which is fundamental you and being, where on your mark, get set, relax. So in, in the fundamental you and being, you realize that you have and are everything you need. Contentment, you have all the contentment that you need and have right here, right now. You have all the love you need right here, right now. You have all the freedom you need right here, right now. And you have all the, which one can I miss? Love. Did I say love? Mm -hmm. Right here, right now. Okay. So, um, we can go to the next slide. So, <clears throat> Radical Ridiculousness is designed right now as a seven-week course. 
But each session is not just focus on the things we talked about. There'll be each session will fo focus on an area where <clears throat> you're stuck in order to get unstuck. It'll focus on emotional healing, focusing on getting going and getting quiet. Now, um, you really don't know what emotional healing is until all of a sudden you discover you're, emotion you, you're emotionally healthy. You're full to the brim. And you don't know you've been unhealthy until you become emotionally healthy. So we all have <clears throat> our issues. Uh, and we can all, we always do better than where we are. So each session will also have, uh, we'll, we'll be playing a lot of comedy clips. There'll be a lot of fun. There'll be a lot of fun exercises. And uh, it should be great. So the benefits <clears throat> include, let me see. There are, there are. All right, I'll just read it. You can laugh when your dreams fall apart at the seams. Who knows where that's from? Huh? You. No, Young at Heart. You know the song Young at Heart? You won't entertain your thoughts. You'll let your thoughts entertain you. You'll change your destiny by changing your density. Next slide. You'll laugh at what is holding you back your fears, your anxieties, your self-destructive thoughts and emotions. You'll have tools to deal with these thoughts and emotions for the rest of your life. You'll say goodbye to the mental pressure cooker. Instead of anchoring on anxiety and contraction, you'll anchor on play and inspired action. You'll say hello to a new optimism, new enthusiasm, a new sense of a bright future, which is calling you. You'll have confidence that all situations are workable and that you are secure in your own being regardless of what happens. You'll truly have fun and enjoy life as you manifest the highest purpose of your life. <clears throat> so, so we're at, we actually living in a shake. Avery! <laughs> That's not the slide that we're supposed oh, to put bro. up. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that's the slide. Oh. Yeah, so we're anxiously living in a shaky... No, no, no. That's it. So we're anxiously living in a shaky shack. And the shaky shack is the world of mental you. But the shack is actually located in a tiny room on a large floor of a huge wing of an immense palace that's divine. So, as B.B. said, the bird of victory finally purchases, 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 <laughs> purchases, <laughs> for a B.B. slip, purchase, purchase on the man who dares. So, the, the course, we go to the next slide. So the, so the, the tuition for the course will never be this low, if there is a course at all. You know. <laughs> but if you register for this amazing course tonight, you can the discount off. price is $97, and we're going to donate $10 to Wisdom's Golden Rod for your, for your daring and, and, and victorious purging. You, you might want to mention to people who don't know that it's going to be in town at the library. Yes, I'm sorry. Thanks, Avery. There Very is a good. poster on the bulletin board in the back. Right. It's not so, here. Right. So the course is going to be held Mondays at the Tompkins County Public Library. It's going to start August 13th and go to August 13th. <laughs> <laughs> it's just going to, it's going to start up. I'll bring, I'll bring something to read. <laughs> Uh, what time so is it? No <laughs> Elliot, what time is it? Okay, it's going to start at 7 o'clock. There is a poster in the back. 7, 7, you go generally 7 to 8.30, could go to 9, but it won't be later than 9, that's for sure. So, uh, so that's it. If you have any questions, uh, 
I'm going to stay late tonight. I don't, I don't think I sort of suspect there's going to be a lot of questions. <laughs> but I'll be happy to answer them. And of course, if you'd like to register, uh, you're cordially invited. I think you'll find it a very useful course to do. So I want to thank you all for coming. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> it was a major contribution to me that you're, that you're here. I desperately hope you got something out of this, but it was certainly a gift to me for your, for your being here. And so if this is something we would like to tell others about, is that the poster was an email that could be... Yeah, no, I even have extra around. poster. I can even give you a poster. No, I'd rather, I, I mean, I'd probably be sending it out as an email. Right. So was that an attachment? The, the poster is, is attached on the golden rod. Yeah, yeah, okay. Email, so you can... I could done with that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so thank you all.